what I want to talk to you about tonight is really much bigger than left and right. It's much bigger than Republican or Democrat. It's about a series of challenges that are lurking on the horizon, all of them to do with technology, that I say could be as transformative for humankind as the agricultural revolution was or the invention of writing. Henry Ford used to tell a story where he would say that when he asked people what they wanted, they would tell him that what they wanted was faster horses. And I think about that story a lot because a lot of our discussions about politics, a lot of our thinking is faster horses thinking. We imagine that the future that we're moving into will be a version that's similar to the one that we currently have, just a little bit faster, a little bit sleeker, a little bit more chromatic. And I disagree with that. I reckon that in our lifetimes, the transition between what we have in politics just now and what we're going to have in the future could be as different from the transition from horses to cars rather than from horses to faster horses. And because we're at a time, I believe, of fundamental change, I use the book, Future Politics, to look at the most fundamental political concepts of all. It helps to step back and look at the big picture. And these are what I'm going to focus on today. Power, freedom, democracy, and justice. And I argue that these words will not mean the same in the future that they do today. But before I get on to that, it's worth perhaps me setting out the empirical basis for my thinking. What, what is the world that we're moving into and how does it differ from today's? I describe what I call the digital life world. And it's a world that's quite unlike our own and it's changed in three significant ways. The first is what I call increasingly capable systems. Now, we know that developments in artificial intelligence and in computing more generally are extraordinary and have been remarkable for the last few years. And when I talk about AI, I'm mostly talking about systems performing tasks which were previously thought to require the cognitive or creative process of processes of human beings. Now we know that there are non-human systems now which can do all manner of things which we would have thought impossible not so long ago, and really not so long ago. And that includes things like translating languages, recognizing faces, mimicking human speech, transcribing conversations, lip reading. But perhaps more remarkably still, they can do some things better than the best human experts can, classifying lung cancers as against harmless growths in the, in the lungs, classifying um, skin cancers, telling the difference between a harmless freckle and a malignant melanoma. AI systems now do that better than the best human experts. They can predict how long you're likely to survive with cancer, or indeed with coronary heart disease, again better than the best human experts. I put passing medical exams there because over the summer in England, where I come from, a chatbot was developed. I'm going to talk about chatbots later in the talk. But a chatbot was developed which could pass the exam to become a member of the Royal College of General Practitioners, uh, better on average than human doctors. Predicting litigation outcomes, terrifyingly for people who do my job, uh, systems can now predict the outcome of appellate cases, both here in the United States and in some courts in Europe, better than the best lawyers can, including people as regards to the Supreme Court who have been clerks to justices of that court. Artificial intelligence systems can beat us at almost every game that we've ever developed. And that started in 79 with backgammon, checkers, chess, when IBM system Deep Blue famously beat Garry Kasparov. And more recently, we've seen the development of systems which can beat the best human experts at the game of Go, a game which is considered to be exponentially more complex than chess. And what's interesting about Go and what's happened in the last couple of years is that in 2016, the system which beat the, one of the finest players in the world, Lee Sedol, beat him 4-1. That was the AlphaGo system. And importantly, I guess, Lee Sedol managed to get a game off that system. But just next year, in an equivalent match, AlphaGo Master thrashed one of the greatest players in the world 3-0. And then, remarkably, AlphaGo Zero, 
just the next year, beat AlphaGo, the system that had beaten Lee Sedol 4-1, 100 times in a row. And what's especially remarkable about, uh, remarkable about AlphaGo Zero is that unlike any of the other systems which had preceded it in any of the other games, AlphaGo Zero had no input from human beings on strategy. So all of the other ones had had some input from human experts as to the best way to win that game. AlphaGo Zero had none. It trained itself to be good at Go by playing against itself thousands and thousands and thousands of times. No humans involved. And that is a system which thrashed 100 nil, the last system on which a human was ever able to get a game. It's worth just pausing to think about the type of artificial intelligence we're talking about here. And this is machine learning systems. You'll, have, you'll probably have heard a lot about machine learning. I know I'm in Seattle, so I don't want to teach you to suck eggs. But uh, machine learning is obviously a particular strain of AI, and it's the one that's most dominant just now. And these aren't systems that think like human beings, and I wouldn't for a second claim that they are. They, think in a diff they, they operate in a different way to the human brain. They process colossal amounts of information, and from that, they're able to detect patterns and skills. So a machine learning system can learn that if a thing looks like X, it is likely to be a Y. So if it looks like a particular type of growth on your skin, it is likely to be a skin cancer. At the same time, they can also learn skills. So if the traffic light is red, stop the car. When you take a drive in a self-driving car, no one will have taught that car how to drive in the same way that you or I were taught to drive. That car will have learned from thousands and thousands of hours of footage of humans driving uh, and synthesized that and discovered the patterns for itself. There are problems with artificial intelligence of the machine learning variety, though, one of which uh, was most famously exemplified by this system, Tay. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. I imagine you are. Microsoft developed this chatbot system to speak like a 17-year-old girl on Twitter. And so Tay was launched with great fanfare in March 2016. And the idea of Tay, as you can see from its description, the last line of it, is the more you talk, the, the smarter Tay gets. So it's a machine learning system that learns in part how to speak from how others speak to it. Tay lasted 16 hours before Microsoft was required to take it down. And the reason Tay had to be taken down was because Tay had become a monster. <laughs> a violent, racist, extremely sexualized uh, imitation of a young woman who had unfortunately learned some bad habits from the people of Twitter. This is one of the tweets that Tay sent. It's a picture of Adolf Hitler, and underneath it it says, swag alert. Swagger since before the internet was even a thing. Uh, another tweet which Tay sent to a young man said, fuck my robot, pussy daddy, I'm such a naughty robot. As a flagship example of Microsoft's AI capacity, this could have gone better, I would suggest. <laughs> But I think that, and you'll see why when I talk about some themes later in the talk, when we think about the power of technology, we have to see when it goes wrong as well, because that has political implications too. But stepping back, and the general pattern is clear. Systems are growing radically more capable. They're doing so on the back of developments in processing power and the vast amounts of data that are in the world, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But as time goes on, these non-human systems are only going to grow more powerful. So that is... Uh, pattern number one. Pattern number two is increasingly integrated technology, and this is important. For most of us here, the primary interface in our lifetimes we've had with technology has been through the keyboard and the mouse and the screen. Before that, it is said, the uh, computer was a room which you walked into and programmed using a, a screwdriver. And right now, since about 2009, we've lived in the age of what's been called the glass slab, where most of us interact with our tech through the glass slabs that are sitting in everyone's pockets in this room. But in the future, it said, technology won't represent any of these things. It'll be dispersed much more seamlessly into the world around us, into our appliances and utilities, to our public spaces and our private spaces, our architecture, our clothes, our homes. Cisco predicts that by 2020, there'll be up to 50 billion devices connected to the internet. And that's devices endowed with processing power, 
and sensors. And the growth of virtual reality and augmented reality systems will only contribute to a world in which the distinction between online and offline, real and virtual, cyberspace and meat space, is a distinction which begins to lose significance if it hasn't already begun. So when we talk about increasingly capable systems and artificial intelligence, don't think that these systems are going to be confined to data centers out in the Arctic or to powerful computers and university campuses. Cloud computing allows them to be beamed into tiny devices. And the Internet of Things, as this is being called, is likely to mean that this kind of intelligence is dispersed into the world around us. It's a radically different world, I suggest, from the one that we live in today. The third main trend is increasingly quantified society. And this is partly a result of the first two trends. But it's said again, by 2020, there'll be 40 zettabytes of data in the world. To put that in context, that's about 3 million books worth of data for every human being on the planet. And we're now generating more data every couple of hours as human beings did from the dawn of civilization until 2003. And what does this data represent? It represents a real-time map of things which, for the, for, the, for the vast majority of human beings that have ever walked on this planet, would have been almost immediately forgotten. That is to say, what you're saying, who you associate with, what you buy, what you care about, where you go, what matters to you, what you find disgusting and unappealing, and what you like and find attractive. These are all things about us that increasingly our systems are gathering data about. And the map of human life is so much more detailed now than it ever was. And that data has been gathered and collected and stored together and made available in permanent or semi-permanent form for analysis and for processing by increasingly capable systems. So stepping back, we're auguring in this world, which, which I say is completely different from any system we've had in the past, where we live alongside non-human systems of extraordinary capacities, even if those capacities are not like ours. That, uh, those systems are dispersed seamlessly into the world around us, often in items we wouldn't previously have seen as technology. And they're gathering data about us at a rate that is growing exponentially and that dwarfs anything in the past that human beings have ever known. And we've never had to live with any of these three trends before. And so when we think about politics, I suggest, we have to take as our starting point that the future really is not going to look like the past. Let's talk about politics. In the book, I start by looking at power which I describe as the godfather of political concepts. And it's worth just taking a moment to define what I mean by power so that we're all on the same page, because I think people use the term quite loosely. I define power, and I take this from uh, various sources of learning, but I define power as a stable and wide-ranging capacity to get others to do things of significance, which they wouldn't otherwise do, or not to do things they might otherwise have done. It's about changing our behavior in a meaningful way. And when I, think, I think when you look at the future of power, you'll find that increasingly power lies in technologies and that those who control the most powerful technologies will have an increasing amount of control over the rest of us. It's profoundly different from the past. And let me just see if I can break this down and make it as clear as I can. There are three ways in which I say that technology can be used to exert power over us. One I call force. There was this story in 2009 about a visit paid by the Prime Minister of my country, Gordon Brown, to the young and cool uh, President of the United States, Barack Obama. And there was this minor scandal in the British press because Brown turned up with 10,000 pounds worth of really thoughtful gifts for the President, including, I believe, a pen that was made from the same wood as the presidential desk, uh, which was in turn made from some um, famous vessel and this was very thoughtful. And uh, in exchange, Mr. Brown received from Barack Obama uh, 25 DVDs um, of classic American films. It's just like one of those really awkward Christmas exchanges where you've put in a huge amount of effort and the other person's clearly not thought about you at all. Anyway, this was written up quite heavily in the British press because uh, it was seen as a great snub, not only to Gordon Brown, but to our country. Um, 
and to the special relationship between Great Britain and the United States. But the real kicker in this story, the real sting in the tail, was that when Gordon Brown got back to number 10 Downing Street, the most powerful man in the land, and sat down with his prime ministerial popcorn and put on a copy of whatever film President Obama had given him, the DVDs wouldn't play <laughs> because they were coded, as all DVDs are, only to play in the region in which they were manufactured. They were US DVDs, so they just wouldn't play in the United Kingdom. And I've always liked this story because it encompasses a very simple fact about technology, which is that a technology, a piece of technology, can only do what it has been coded to do. And asking a piece of technology to do something that it hasn't been coded to do is as futile as uh, getting into a, a, a cupboard and asking it to take you to the fifth floor. It doesn't make sense. And so in the future, this is a roundabout way of saying, we're going to be surrounded by very powerful technologies, very subtle technologies that have rules coded into them that you and I don't necessarily have a voice in shaping. So when you take your first drive in a self-driving car, let's say you need to rush to the hospital, it's an emergency, and you ask that system to go over the speed limit, as you would if you were driving your own car. Not massively, maybe five or 10 miles an hour, but enough to make a difference. In all likelihood, that vehicle is going to refuse to do what you ask it to do just as it is going to refuse to park on a double yellow line just for 30 seconds so you can nip into the shop, just as it will refuse to drive onto land which its GPS systems tell it are private property, and just as it will pull over for the police car automatically, even if it were in ordinary circumstances in that situation, that's not what you would choose to do. You are subject to the rules, whatever they may be, that have been coded into that vehicle and when you are surrounded by technology, you are subject to the rules of that technology. And it will be everywhere. And so increasingly, and we'll tease out some of the consequences of this, increasingly we're subject to other people's rules. It used to be that the main rules we were subject to were laws. Added to that, we now have code. And sometimes we have code that embodies laws. But in the future, it'll be a form of force. And that's the first way that technology exerts power. It sets rules that the rest of us have to follow, whether we're Gordon Brown or whether it's you and I. The second way that technology exerts power is through scrutiny. And scrutiny is a term that I use broadly to refer to the gathering of information about us. And gathering information about other people helps you to exert power over them in one of two ways. The first I describe as the auxiliary function of scrutiny, and which is more complicated than it sounds. Basically, the more you know about someone, the easier it is to influence or manipulate them. So if you know what gets someone going, what grinds their gears, what they're afraid of, and what they love, and what they care about, it's much easier to influence or even manipulate them. And that, of course, is the basis of all online advertising, which gathers data about us and then presents us with information that the algorithm considers we would find attractive. And increasingly, it's the basis of political advertising, too. It's said that in the last presidential election, Cambridge Analytica, who were engaged by the Trump campaign, had up to 5,000 points of data, about 200 million separate Americans. And they were able to use that data to present targeted messages to those individuals or, or, or to groups comprising a relatively small number of individuals to present the political campaign in as favorable as way as possible to those individuals. It's a form of influence that influencers of any kind, political or commercial in the past, can only have dreamed of. And so the more the data is gathered about us, the more easy it is to influence us, and as I say, to manipulate us. That's the first way that scrutiny can lead to power over us. The second way is more subtle, though. I call it the disciplinary effect of scrutiny. Quite an old idea in political philosophy that when we're being watched, we, changed our we change our behavior. We're less likely to do things that others perceive as sinful or shameful or wrong. And in the future, I think we're all going to be much more aware of the fact that we're being watched a lot of the time. And it would surprise me if that didn't have some effect on our behavior. There was a story recently about an American couple where the, the wife uh, was killed and the husband was accused of the murder. And at the trial, his defense was that 
they had been subject, the two of them, to a home invasion. And the burglars, in the course of that invasion, had tied them up, both of them, uh, burgled the house, and in the course of this, they had murdered the wife. The difficulty with his testimony was that the wife was wearing a Fitbit at the time of her death. And the Fitbit revealed that at the time of her death, or around the time of her death, she wasn't still, she wasn't tied down. She was, in fact, moving quite energetically around the house. That is to say, she was running away. Um, and that completely contradicted his story. And he was convicted of her murder. Um, less gruesomely, a friend of mine recently uh, went through a breakup in a relationship. And the next morning, she received a notification on her phone from the smart scales that she and her boyfriend, who had been living together, were using in their bathroom. So it's a system of scales that you step on, and it sends your body mass information to your phone. Um, she was still receiving notifications from those scales, and the, the notification that she received uh, indicated to her that someone was standing in those scales at a quite an early time in the morning whose body profile matched neither hers nor that of her boyfriend uh, and instead matched that of a, a young and slender woman. Um, and that was how she discovered what had really been going on behind her back. You're less likely, if you're a spouse cheating on your wife, to take a journey in your car if you know that the journey is going to be logged on your self-driving car or whatever it is. Just as uh, the situation now where you're less likely to search for the words child pornography on Google if you know, as is the case, that Google automatically reports that to law enforcement officials. Knowing that information is being gathered about us changes our behavior. It's the second way that the power of scrutiny gives those who own and con control technology a new form of power in society. And the third way that technologies control us or can be exert, used to exert control, for good or bad, is through perception control. You and I are only able to see a certain amount of the world through our senses. And we rely on others to present us with information from outside of our immediate perception. And increasingly, we rely on technologies to do it. So when we search for news, we quite often use, and increasingly will use, online platforms to do that. Whether it's your Facebook news feed or your Twitter feed, increasingly algorithms uh, and AI systems actually gather and write the news as well. A lot of financial reports and sports reports are not drafted by human beings. So we rely on technology to tell us the news, but also crucially to edit and sort it, to decide which slice of the world, and it can only ever be a very small slice, we are presented with. Obviously, it matters which slice we're presented with, because if something isn't even on your radar, if you don't even know that it's happened or is happening, you're less likely to care about it. Or if you're constantly told that something is wrong or disgusting, you're yourself more likely in due course to believe that it's wrong or disgusting. So we place an enormous amount of trust in those, human or digital, that filter the world around us and present us with a slice of reality. And crucially, the slice that you see may be different from the person next to you and the slice they see. Likewise, we rely on technologies when we go out and search for information about the world. We don't look in encyclopedias anymore. We use Google and whatever is going to replace Google. And it won't be like typing in, in text into a box. We and our children in due course will search for information by asking oracles of a sort in our homes questions, like we've already begun to do with Amazon Echo devices. That's what search will look like in the future. You'll ask a question in human language, in natural language, and you'll get an answer. But of course, the answer that you get will be extremely important, because over time, those answers build up a picture, and they shape the way that we perceive the world. I put communication on there, not because this is something that necessarily immediately affects an American audience, but if you're in China and you use their equivalent of WhatsApp called WeChat, if I send a message to you saying the words Amnesty International, that message never arrives, simply never gets there. And neither you nor I are told that the message was sent. So those who control the technologies through which we increasingly communicate with each other also control our perception of the world to a certain extent. 
And finally, augmented reality technologies, which are very much in their infancy. These are technologies which you place uh, on your person to uh, mediate between you and the real world. So the earliest forms take the form of smart glasses and smart earbuds or smart contact lenses are in um, development. And the idea is that they either overlay the world with certain information. So you look at something and it tells you what it is, a bird or a butterfly. Or well, they block certain things out. So last month, a, a system was announced that was basically a pair of glasses, quite, quite in, uh, innocuous looking glasses, that block out screens. So the idea is that we see too many screens, they're distracting. We'll develop a system where screens just appear to you when you're wearing these glasses as blank spaces. And it occurs to me that actually it's not at all unlikely that that system could be used to prevent you from seeing things that trigger you. Uh, whether you've had a trauma or a, a phobia of some kind. Earbuds could block them out, glasses could block them out. Wouldn't surprise me if that was the way that this technology was developed. In fact, there's a guy in Silicon Valley who's developed an application for these glasses that blocks out um, homeless people. So you just can't see them. You're walking down the street in San Francisco where there's a big homelessness problem and where there's a homeless person who just appears as a blank space. That's what the, the guy's developing. So increasingly, those who control those technologies control what we do and do not see of the world, although we may have a choice in it when the time comes. So stepping back, force, scrutiny, and perception control. These are three forms of power which have sort of existed in different forms throughout human history, but in technology are, are massively supercharged. And this is new. It's new to human politics, these new and strange forms of power, and they're very, very potent perhaps more effective on our everyday lives in the near future than what we would cons traditionally consider to be politics, the politics of parliaments and legislatures and the like. What does this mean for freedom and the future of freedom? Ask yourself if you've ever streamed a movie or a TV show online without having paid for it, or if you've paid someone cash in hand, perhaps a cleaner or a builder, with knowing that that money was, there's no tax going to be paid on that money. Or if you jumped onto a bus and off again without paying a fare. Or if you've taken more than your fair share of soda at the soda dispenser, having only paid for one cup full. These are things that 74% of British people admit to having done, at least one of. And I don't think it's because we are scoundrels. I think it's because in a civilized society, at the edge of the law, there is this area of naughtiness, just like the area of naughtiness where you can sometimes drive over the speed limit or park on a double yellow, which allows us to do things which are wrong or even illegal, as long as we don't do them too often and as long as they don't cause other people harm. Not every one of those crimes is prevented or prosecuted. In the future, I just don't think these kinds of mini crimes are going to be possible. You can't pay someone cash in hand in a cashless economy. You can't dodge a bus fare if the fare is automatically deducted from your smart wallet when you get on the bus. You can't stream an episode of Game of Thrones if the digital rights management technology of the kind that Gordon Brown came up against is so tough that only a very, very serious hacker can get around it. And you can't get more than your fair share of Soda, if the soda is dispensed using a face recognition system like the kind you have on your iPhone. And if that sounds petty, I'll now explain to you why there is a toilet roll on the slide. You've all waited very patiently, wondering why it's there. If you go to the Temple of Heaven Park in Beijing and you use the public facilities there, you will find that your helping of toilet roll is distributed according to face recognition technology because there was a problem in there, apparently, with people taking more than their fair share. It would be strange to my mind if governments and corporations didn't use these relatively ubiquitous technologies to make their lives easier and to enforce the rules that they're trying to enforce. So the first thing that I think about freedom in the future is that that hinterland of naughtiness that I described a minute ago is likely to shrink. At the same time, technologies will expand our freedoms in various ways by enabling us to do stuff that we could never previously have done. But I do think it's an important development in human society. And as Larry Lessig said, there is a big difference between a door with a sign on it which says, do not enter, but which you can enter at pain of future punishment, and a locked door. 
and in the future, I suggest the future is going to look a little bit more like a locked door than it is like a door saying, do not enter. And what that means is that increasingly, as Roger Brownsword put it, the question won't be what's right or moral in a given circumstance. The question for us will be what's possible. And I think that has interesting implications for human freedom and particularly for the way that we raise our kids. But what's also interesting about the future is that questions of freedom are going to be increasingly decided by tech firms and by private entities rather than by the state. And I think that's an unusual development in human politics as well. So for example, if you look at freedom of speech, a lot of very important political speech now takes place online on platforms owned and controlled by private entities. And if you're banned from Twitter, that's it. If you're censored on Facebook, by its moderators, that's it. You can't post a tweet of more than 280 characters in length because the rules, the code doesn't allow it. The way we communicate with each other is subject to rules that are decided privately by the legal and public policy and software teams within tech firms. So freedom of speech as a kind of, as something we value, is something that is increasingly in the hands of non-state and non-public entities. Likewise, freedom of thought, the same firms that decide which slice of the world we see, to an extent decide whether we can truly be considered autonomous individuals. If you're presented with a slice of the world that simply isn't true, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on, and it's questionable whether you can be called a, th a free thinker of the kind that philosophers have thought about in the past. Freedom of movement, whether it's self-driving cars or whatever comes after them, and interestingly as well, freedom of conscience. Now, our, our commitment to liberty here in the, the West has always been measured by our tolerance of things which are considered at the extremes, deviant, immoral, weird, uh, taboo. A virtual reality system was announced last week by Oculus, which is owned by Facebook, which promises arena-style experiences. And it's easy, I think, to imagine some applications of that which people would want to have. So I was imagining maybe using that system to f explore what it was like to participate in the D-Day landings in 1944. Storming the beaches, getting off the transports, hearing the bullets and seeing the sand and the waves and the blood and the chaos and the terror, but also the thrill and the adrenaline. Now, I think if I asked most of you in this room, you'd say that was an acceptable use of that technology. You wouldn't have any problem with it. You might not want young kids using it. But what about if you want to experience being on the other side, defending the beaches on behalf of the Nazi regime? Or further, if you wanted to experience being an executioner at one of the Nazi gas chambers, or one of the terrorists who committed 9-11, the, the, the traditional answer we'd give to these questions is actually, and it, come, it's, it goes back to John Stuart Mill in the 19th century, by and large in free societies, we are free to do anything as long as it doesn't harm other people, which is why you're allowed to imagine in your head acts of unbelievable depravity, but that's not itself a crime because no one is harmed by it. So why doesn't the same argument apply to VR? Maybe it does, virtual reality. If you want to have virtual reality sexual intercourse with an avatar, with something that looks like your neighbor's wife, should you be allowed to do that? It doesn't harm her. She'll never know about it. No one will ever know about it. Or, under, or sex with a, a, a virtual child. The interesting thing about these questions, I think, is not necessarily the questions themselves, although they are interesting, and I suspect that there'll be a diversity of views in this room about whether this stuff should be allowed. But who takes that decision? In the past, I would suggest these were considered matters for society as a whole to determine. I, I would argue they still are. But as things stand, these are decisions that are taken by tech firms. They are the ones that set the limits of our freedom of conscience. They decide what we can and cannot do using the technologies that we are increasingly surrounded by. So again, when you get in your self-driving car and it refuses to take you to KFC because it, the owners of that system don't like battery farm chicken, 
or refuses to take you to a brothel because it's considered immoral, that's not a decision that's down to you in that immediate sense anymore. So I think it's interesting that a lot of our freedoms in the future are going to be in the hands of tech firms. And I don't, I don't mean this facetiously, but I also don't think that a lot of these tech firms are, have, know as much about the principles of freedom and the ethics of freedom as they do about the technologies themselves. I think that's a problem. Democracy. This is one I think that a lot of us are troubled by a lot of the time, and perhaps some of the earliest effects of technology have been most visible. We already know that in the internet era, uh, the internet has transformed the way that citizens interact with political parties, in that most political organizing now takes place on online, whereas a generation ago it didn't. It's changed our relationship with the state, e-petitions, online consultations, the fact that you can now tweet a politician directly. They've transformed our relationship with people in power. And they've transformed the relationship between citizen and citizen, allowing forms of organization at a relatively low cost and high speed that would have been very difficult in the pre-internet era. So look at the Arab Spring, look at the Occupy movement, look at the Move On movement. These are all forms of political organization that have been enabled by the internet that I suggest would have been much more difficult in previous times. And we also know that the internet and social media have affected the way that we deliberate and the way we discuss issues as a democracy. We know that fragmentation is one result of social media. That if you're following the midterm elections on Twitter and you're of a democratic inclination, you're much more likely, 90% more likely, to follow Democrat accounts. And so most of the news you'll see will come from people who share views quite similar to your own. And we also know that when you spend more time with people, online or offline, who share your views, you tend to become more entrenched in those views. And so the very people who need to be exposed to other perspectives are the ones who are least exposed to them. And so we become polarized as well as fragmented. And we also know that our sensitivity to falsehood, how much we care about it, is significantly dulled in circumstances where we are so fragmented and so polarized that we come to believe what we want to believe. It's not quite as simple as that, though, because the truth about fake news is that a, the real problem is that a lot of stuff online looks plausible and just isn't, in the sense that it's just not true. So the top 20 fake news stories of the last election on Facebook were as shared and viewed as the top 20 news stories, which were true, from the Wall Street Journal and New York Times and other major news outlets. And 75% of people who read those stories believed they were true. Very hard to deliberate to conduct a rational deliberation where a, a large amount of the population is proceeding from, from assumptions that are simply factually false. And I see that as both a ph philosophical and a technical problem. I think for too long we've been too tolerant of the idea that everyone has their own truth. I don't think that's right. I think we need to reassert the idea that in some senses there are, there are truths or at least propositions that can be tested empirically. And it's also a technical problem uh, for, for firms to deal with. But none of these issues actually with democracy that I'm talking about just now I think are either fatal to it or radically change what it means to be a democracy. That is to say, I think they are faster horses issues and I think we'll get over them in the next few years. When I think about the future of democracy, I actually see four more fundamental challenges in our lifetime which are perhaps more interesting. The first is the automation of deliberation. If there are chatbots which can already pass diagnostic exams better than the best human experts. And we know that there are machine learning systems which can write political speeches if they churn through enough political speeches from the past to learn from them. So we used to have politicians who sound like robots and now we have robots that sound like politicians. <laughs> it's not hard to imagine a future in which online discourse is colonized by non-human entities which are faster than us wittier than us, more numerous than us, perhaps less well-meaning than us, but even if they're well-meaning, just better than us at debating stuff online. What place is there for us in a system like that? Another challenge is the challenge of direct democracy. One of the main reasons we have a system of representative democracy, one of them, not the only one, but one of them is that it's considered, it has always been considered implausible for everyone in an advanced polity to vote on everything. It's just impractical. 
it's no longer impractical. In fact, it, it, within a few years, it would be completely possible if we, if we wanted for all of us to vote on everything from a device in our pockets several times a day. Or if we didn't want to vote on individual things, to delegate our vote to someone who else who did. So, you know, on a question of healthcare, I delegate my vote to a patient interest group or a consortium of doctors and nurses. We're going to have to rehab, I believe, the philosophical debate about whether more democracy is always better or whether the real test of a democracy is the limits you put on it, the liberal aspect of democracy, the rule of law, um, the balance of powers and the separation of powers. Because I can certainly see populist movements which say what we really need to do is unleash the power of democracy to give power back to the people, directly to the people, scrap the politicians. We should all vote on everything all the time. Technically, it will be possible. Never was before. So that's a debate we're going to have to have. Data democracy. It is strange that we say, to my mind, that we have governments that represent the people when all, when all that they really represent is one tick in a box from a small number of citizens every few years. In a world where there is three million books worth of data for every person on the planet, it would seem to me strange that we say that the government which best represents the people is the one based on those ticks and boxes. We do sometimes use big data to solve public policy problems, but to my mind, it's likely to become a question of legitimacy itself. Can a government be truly said to represent the people if it doesn't take into account their actual lived experiences? And if the data is good enough for corporate interests to understand our lives, why is it not good enough for governments? Finally, the question of AI democracy, and I think this often you know, encourages people to think about sort of robot overlords, and that's not really what I have in mind, but I do think we're increasingly trusting artificial intelligence systems with very important tasks, trading stocks on our behalf, diagnosing our cancers. It's not crazy to ask which aspect, if any, of public administration might be better handled by automated systems than by human beings. It might just be the traffic system in a city or the, the water board, but it also might be some more profound stuff than that. And an AI democracy might look at different from what you imagine. Rather than having one centralized artificial intelligence system, we might all have an AI in our pockets, which, which answers a thousand questions a day on our behalf based on the values that we've told it that we have, the things that we care about, and the data that it has about our lives. And rather than saying yes or no on every issue, it could grade our response. It could say, yes, we strongly are in favor of this, or it could caveat our response by saying, we like this policy, but would you change X and Y? And all of that could be fed into a more centralized system of decision making. The possibilities are, are pretty radical when it comes to artificial intelligence and the future of public policy making. And if I may say so, I think that we're nowhere in thinking about them. But what I will say is that I think we are naive if, like every generation before us, we consider that the form of government we currently have is the highest and final form, particularly when you look at how rubbish it is most of the time. So I think that in our generation, we're going to have to deal with these four problems. We're going to have to find the aspects of these challenges which can work in our favor and filter out those which are bad and difficult and wrong. It's an imposing task. I don't deny that. But I think it's one that we can't ignore anymore. Finally, justice. I believe that the developments that I've described in technology are of profound significance for what I call, it's not what I call, for social justice. Um, I don't mean right now justice of the kind you get in a court. I mean justice in terms of two other things. First of all, justice in distribution. Who has what in society? Questions of equality and inequality and the distribution of benefits and burdens. And what's interesting about the moment where the we're living is that, is that increasingly the distribution of really important stuff is being done by automated systems. 72% of resumes are never read by human beings anymore. They are read by automated systems. Credit, mortgages, insurance, whether you get these things and the terms on which you get them are increasingly decided by algorithms. These are not small things. These are major things. They are what determine a happy and healthy and safe life from a sad and unhealthy and unsafe one. And we entrust the decisions to systems which are sometimes 
good, sometimes bad, but always almost, sorry, almost always opaque. Just looking at jobs for a second, you may have seen the story just last week about Amazon's recruitment mechanism. Amazon, a very sophisticated company, from 2014 to 2017, employed a machine learning system to try and filter out good candidates from bad candidates who wanted to come and work at Amazon. And the way it did it was it gave data to this system from the previous 10 years at Amazon, from its successful employees and their resumes, and said, find the patterns. Find what it is that is most likely to indicate success as an Amazon employee. The difficulty was that for reasons which were not good reasons, Amazon had been a predominantly male culture up until that point. And so what these machine learning systems learned was that the best indicator of success, if you're going to work at Amazon, is being a guy. Which means that if your resume said women's volleyball team as opposed to just volleyball team, it went to the bottom of the pile. If your resume contained the words describing a all women's college, bottom of the pile. This is Amazon for three years. Now bear in mind that 72% of CVs, resumes, often for much less sophisticated jobs than Amazon, are read by algorithms which are likely themselves to be much less sophisticated too. These aren't corporate issues. They're not even technical issues. They're political issues. They matter in a way that goes beyond the market system or the pursuit of profit. The second way that justice is being transformed by technology is the problem of recognition. There is injustice in the relationship between the master and the slave, or the boss who screams at the employee, or the wife who cowers before her husband. And these injustices, I would say, have nothing to do with the distribution of stuff. They're about failures of recognition, failures of one human being to recognize another human being as being of equal moral worth. And actually, the politics of recognition uh, dominates American politics today, whether it's white working class men protesting against what they see as being ignored or disrespected, rural groups protesting against urban groups, uh, Black Lives Matter, hashtag Me Too. These are all different identity groups who aren't asking for more stuff. In fact, often they're offended by offers of more stuff. What they're asking for is to be seen and treated as equal, or in some sense as equal. The difficulty with technology, though, is that it used to just be that humans could offend us and treat us less uh, favorably, but no longer. There are face recognition systems that don't see people of color because they've only been trained on white faces. There are soap dispensers that don't dispense soap to non-white hands because they've only been trained on white hands. There are voice recognition systems that don't hear the voices of women because they've only been trained on male voices. There's a passport system, an automated passport system in New Zealand which refused the application of a man of Asian ethnicity because it said that his eyes were closed in the photo that he had submitted to it because it had only been trained on white faces. It used to be that only humans could <laughs> lead to failures of recognition. Now our machines can as well. And increasingly, they'll be everywhere. And if you imagine the anger that you feel when your computer isn't working, think how upset you'll feel the first time you don't get a job because of the color of your skin or because of your gender, or when you feel like you're being wrongly deprioritized for health insurance or for a mortgage, or when you're not recognized and granted access to a building or a piece of technology because your face is the wrong color. The risk is that we move into a world of magnified injustice and new injustices. And again, this isn't a matter of corporate policy. It's not just a matter of technical defects with the data and with the algorithms. These are problems of, of a political nature. So when I talk about future politics, I, I try to think about what we're going to do about all of these challenges. What, uh, what's the way forward? And I often start with an anecdote from actually the past. Again, it's a prime ministerial anecdote, and it concerns like, the guy on the left, William Gladstone, who was prime minister of the United Kingdom in the Victorian times, and the great scientist, Michael Faraday. 
And the story is told of when Gladstone went to visit Faraday in his laboratory so that he could see the great invention of electricity. And Faraday showed it to Gladstone. And Gladstone, who was a sort of grumpy guy, he said to, to Faraday, well, what does it do? And Faraday gave a scientific explanation and all the uses it would be put to in the laboratory. And Gladstone said, yes, but what does it actually do? What does this invention do? And Faraday again explained how it was a great leap forward in terms of the scientific principles that he'd been working on. Gladstone said, yes, but what does it do? This conversation went on and on. Uh, and then Faraday eventually replied to Gladstone, well, I don't know what it does, but I'm sure, I'm sure you'll find some way of taxing it in due course. <laughs> when I look around the world today, I see that it's being remade by two groups. There are Faradays, scientists and engineers, who are brilliant at what they do, but don't always see the moral and political implications of their work. And there are Gladstones, people who know a lot about politics, but know very little about technology. And these are the ones who we are trusting right now to make sure that the world we're moving into is a good world. Just looking for a moment at the Faradays, and there are a lot of them here in Seattle, I, and I don't mean that remotely offensively, because the truth is that when we train our computer scientists and software engineers, we don't say that the ethics and politics of their work is a central part of their studies. You know, the ethics of AI module is one that you can do voluntarily in your third year of a computer science degree. Tim Berners-Lee there, who invented the World Wide Web, has this phrase where he, he, referring to engineers like him, said, we're not analyzing the world. We're not analysts. We're building a world. And in a sense, he's right. For all the reasons I've already given, technology is transforming the world. But I think unwittingly, he reflected a statement that was made a long time earlier by a guy called Karl Marx. He said the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. And this was a revolutionary slogan for 100 years. This is what people cried as they leapt over the barricades. And my view is that if you're going to remake the world, if you're going to change the world, you need to know the morality that underpins it. You need to know that there is a body of Western thought at the very least, and I limit my thinking to Western thought because it's all that I know about, that has gone through some of these issues before, issues of democracy and liberty and justice, and thought about the rights and wrongs of them, and that you don't need to come up with it again over the lunchtime in the lunch hall at Google. You need to go out there and learn the wisdom that already exists. So we need more of what Tim Berners-Lee himself described as philosophical engineers. But the truth is we also need our technologists to be more diverse. It's not surprising that you have sexist outcomes from technology when 90% of executives in Silicon Valley are men, or that you sometimes get racist outcomes when just 3% of people in Silicon Valley are people of African-American extraction. And, and I say this respectfully, it is not, <laughs> it is not right that uh, those who create the most powerful technologies often have political views that are far outside the mainstream. So 44% of early Bitcoin adopters are anarcho-capitalists who favor elimination of the state. If you're going to remake the world, you have to assume the philosophical and intellectual responsibilities that come with that as well. And to my mind, the people of Silicon Valley and the people of the tech world are not yet up to that. But likewise, neither are the politicians who in due course will seek to regulate them. I mean, just look at Orrin Hatch's face here as he questions Mark Zuckerberg, asking him how Facebook makes money even though it doesn't charge its users. This is one of the most senior legislators in the, legislators in the country who doesn't understand the business model of almost all online commerce. It's not good enough. I don't know if this meme has reached America. <laughs> but we also have a problem in political theory, which is where I come from, which is that most political theory in the academy is written as if the world will be the same in 2050 as it was in 1950. I mean, my undergraduate degree was only 10 years ago, but the world was already obviously changing then. 
And it, it baffled me that so many of my textbooks didn't even make reference to the internet, let alone what was around the corner. And you know, even still, when we try to describe the future, how many of us reach for the names of fiction writers from the early 20th century, Orwell, Huxley, Wells, when we try to describe the world that we're moving into, where are the philosophers of the 21st century whose works we, we know in the same way that we know them? The truth is they don't exist because by and large the academy, which I'm not part of, but the academy doesn't reward that kind of thinking. It doesn't reward breadth, it doesn't reward big books on big topics, it rewards narrow research on narrow topics. And likewise, it doesn't reward cross-disciplinary work by and large. And here we are right at the intersection between science and the social sciences. And there are too few minds around the world working at that intersection, despite it being the greatest challenge of our generation. I think that's a problem. But finally, as well as Gladstones and Faradays, there are us, the citizens, who want to be able to hold the Gladstones and the Faradays to account and to make sure that the wonders of technology are used to make our lives better, which they certainly can be. And my main message in respect of what the rest of us have to do is that we have to stop looking at technology just as consumers, which is what we've done for the last 20 years. And what we need is a sea change of the kind that we've had in relation to climate change. And obviously, we're nowhere near there. But 30 years ago, if, say, a new form of air transport had been invented, I think a lot of us would have thought, that's awesome. How can I get a ride on that? Um, look how quickly it will get me from A to B. Whereas I think now a lot of us genuinely would ask, how much fossil fuel does that burn? Is that, is that a useful or helpful application of technology? That's the way we need to start thinking about all digital technology. So when Apple or Google or Microsoft or Facebook comes out with something new, we have to approach it with the same civic skepticism as we do when a politician comes out with something new or when a government comes out with something new. And you know, I put regulating at the bottom of that little diagram there because people are leaping to the question of regulation long before we've even understood the technologies and organized in respect of them. And that's why I think that you don't hear very many satisfactory answers about the regulation of technology because we haven't gone back and done the legwork intellectually about the problems of technology that are actually being thrown up. We're just jumping to the end. And then we have Orrin Hatch and um, the Orrin Hatches of the world who are, try who are going eventually to try and regulate technologies that they don't properly understand, which is in no one's interest, not Silicon Valley's interest, not in your eyes interest. So my message, my challenge to you, the people of Seattle, but also to citizens generally, is the digital is political. And whether they know it or not, and indeed whether they like it or not, software engineers are increasingly social engineers. And the last century, the 20th century, was all about one big question in politics. It was what should be left to the market and to civil society and what should be done by the state? That was the great ideological debate that divided the Eastern world from the Western world and within these societies, the left from the right. The big question of our time is to what extent should our lives be governed and directed by powerful digital systems and on what terms? Power, freedom, democracy, justice. These futures are intertwined with technology. They cannot be separated from it. And so uh, to all of you, I would say the digital is political and um, whether it's in your work or your life as a consumer, bear that in mind and bring that same skepticism that human beings have always brought to new and strange forms of power that have been brought over them. Because um, then I really think that we can make a success out of the century if we do that. Thanks very much. All right, so we've got some time for questions. If you don't mind coming up to the microphone, uh, that would be really helpful. Um, and just make sure to keep your question brief so we can get through as many as possible. Thanks. Do you see governments dissolving? No, I see them getting more powerful. 
And I think that it's a great and easy fallacy that writers about tech say that, just, oh, because Google and Facebook are getting more and more powerful, it's the end of the nation state. On the contrary, the state is going to co-opt technology to as great extent as possible in order to keep itself powerful within the domain in which it has control. The logical conclusion of this is China, where almost all technology is uh, in some sense co-opted and regulated by the state and also used for authoritarian ends. But one of the great battles of this century is going to be between tech firms who want to retain their independence and governments which want to get their hands on the juicy technologies that they have. So at one end of the spectrum, you have Apple refusing to give the password to the iPhone of the San Bernardino terrorists. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, you have the companies who gather data because it's actually not, it is unconstitutional for the state here to gather data, but it's not uncon unconstitutional for it to buy it. So there are companies which harvest data from all different data sources, package it up and sell it to the US government. And so at one end of the spectrum, you have tech firms which work with the state on a kind of commercial basis, and at the other end, you have others that sort of resist the state. But even the ones at this end, as Apple found, may well end up succumbing to the state anyway, as because you, as you recall, the state eventually said we don't need the password anymore. I wonder why. Because um, they'd hacked into the system. And Edward Snowden suggests that actually uh, the US government has, has hacked into lots of systems, so it doesn't have to do the work for itself. So I strongly believe that um, technology is going to supercharge the nation state. And it's one of the reasons why I don't uh, uh, willy-nilly support or advocate regulation or nationalization because I do actually believe that the state is itself a large concentration of power which we got to keep an eye on just as much as we got to keep an eye on tech firms. I hope that goes some way to answering your question. Could I ask a follow-up? Of course you can. You just briefly mentioned security. Do you think that systems are ever going to be created that are secure enough for us to rely on? Well, we already <laughs> rely on lots well, of them. Well, uh, maybe I should say uh, <laughs> that we won't be crippled yeah. when they go down. I mean, there's no end state. There are advances in security and in cryptography and there are advances in hacking that take place at the same time. And I see it as an ongoing battle. Let's see what happens with blockchain technology. I think there's quite a lot of hype around that as an ultra secure form of transacting or securing um, information. I, I think it might be a little overhyped and it's certainly too early to tell. And I also think you know there will be ways to hack that system as well that we haven't thought of yet. But the truth is we already rely on secure technological systems to secure the money in our bank accounts, which sometimes goes wrong. Um, the data on our social media, which sometimes goes wrong. The nuclear arsenal hasn't gone wrong yet. Hopefully it won't. Um, no, I don't think we'll ever reach a world where someone can say, I've secured this piece of technology in a way that is 100% secure in the same way that I don't think a door can ever be 100% locked. So um, that remains to be seen. Hi, thanks, that's a really interesting talk. Um, Thank you. So a question, um, so in a democracy, as you know, is very clunky, very slow moving, mm. and uh, power is increasingly concentrating in tech technology companies like Facebook and Apple, especially like with artificial intelligence, there mm. are the amount of computing power that's required for that concentrates is there, but it, yet it also moves very rapidly. So how can you see that how a democracy could possibly manage such a fast moving, changing technology when it's so slow to be able to react to any of these? Kind it, of it's the major problem of our generation. And the truth is we are already behind I mean, I, I get a lot of people, I, I'm often asked, are you, are you optimistic or pessimistic? And the answer is, I can't be either of those things because we haven't even gotten to the ring yet. And it, it, it's not unusual for technology to move faster than the laws that regulate it and the norms that regulate it. That's always been the case because you can't, you can't create a law for a technology that doesn't yet exist. 
or, or, or to expect that to happen would be asking too much of a democracy. The difference now, as you indicate, though, is that the speed of technological change is, 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 is increasing. It, it's exploding, in fact. And as I argue in my book, we don't even have the words to describe what's happening, let alone the ideas to critique it or the laws in mind that could fix it. So it is a great challenge. I don't think it's beyond our ken is the truth. I, I do think we can do it, but I think time is running out. Uh, and if, if, if I'm still giving this talk in 20 years or 10 years, mm -hmm. I think something will have gone seriously wrong. And the democratic structures which we I think have taken for granted. I think less people people are taking less for granted these days. Uh, will be even more fragile than they are just now. So, I do think we can catch up, but we've got to start now. Got to start now. Can't wait any longer. So I'll ask you the follow up that you probably won't like to hear. In what way sort of specifically could you see that uh, happening? Yeah, I mean, like what would be just not actual laws, but mm. just kind of a framework for how that might In the book, I talk about two principles. One is the principle of transparency, and the other, the other is the principle of structural regulation. Transparency is basically what it says on the tin, which is that right now we rely on the benevolence of tech firms and firms generally to do their best and to look out for us in the algorithms that govern our lives. <laughs> I don't think that is good enough. I don't think it's good enough that Jack Dorsey, the brilliant and well-meaning head of Twitter, can come to Congress last month and say, I've decided to hold my hands up and tell you about something that went wrong at Twitter. At a very important time in a very important election cycle, the Twitter algorithm inadvertently downgraded 600,000 accounts from public consciousness, including the accounts of some politicians who are actually actively seeking re-election, re and it may well have influenced the election result. But don't worry, because we are working hard to make sure that our algorithm is neutral and impartial. There's so much in that that blows my mind. The first is that we have to wait until someone comes to Congress to tell us that. The second is that we have to rely on Jack Dorsey's goodwill to tell us that and, and you know, respect to him for actually coming out with it. The third is the idea that we should just trust that assuming we agree with the principles of neutrality and impartiality as the basis for Twitter's algorithm, that we should just trust that the algorithm itself embodies those values. Whereas, of course, as, as he has already told us, things sometimes go wrong. So even if you have good principles, the algorithm might not reflect them. But even the concepts of neutrality and impartiality are so complicated, or at least so subtle, that I would be greatly reassured if, if that process was open to more public scrutiny and debate to people who have studied those concepts and worked with them in law, in politics, in ethics. Because the idea of a, a bunch of dudes in Silicon Valley sitting around and saying, yeah, we've come up with the idea of neutrality, it's a good one. Neutrality uh, is not, to me, a reassuring concept. Um, and I'll come back to neutrality in a second. So, so one of my arguments in the book is, it's never been the case as human beings in politics that we have simply allowed power to accrue over our heads and trusted the benevolence of those who wield that power to do a good job with it. Since the Roman times and the Greek times, we've always said, if you're going to govern us in some meaningful way, we'd like to see what you're up to while you're doing it. And we'd like maybe to have fences at the top of the cliff rather than an ambulance at the bottom. So one of the things that I think we'll move towards is a system of more transparency. There are obvious problems because it's difficult to understand algorithms a lot of the time. We can talk about that more if you want, but right now we're nowhere. I mean, most algorithms that govern our lives are commercial black boxes. They are literally secrets, and the data that goes into them is a secret, and I don't think it's increasingly going to wash. The second is structural, as in that I think that no tech firm or government should be allowed to secure too much of the uh, means of force that I described, so the rule setting, too much of the means of scrutiny, or too much of the means of perception control, if you recall those are the three ingredients of power that I discussed, nor should any particular entity have all three. Shouldn't be able to scrutinize us, control our perception, and write the rules. And in that sense, what I propose structurally is a little bit like antitrust law, but it's not the same because what antitrust law regulates is economic abuses of power, whereas I'm more interested in the acquisition of political power. And so I think if we start saying 
that no tech firm should be allowed to acquire too much of the political power as described, or, or something like it, um, then we can break up companies based on that model. That is, to me, what we will have to look at in the future. But I, I'm sure other people will come up with more brilliant stuff. But that, to me, is the starting point. I'm just going to come back to neutrality, even though it's not part of your question, because it's something that interests me and get, grinds my gears. A lot of engineers seem to have this view that if you can make an algorithm neutral, then that's the end of the story, and, and it's a sort of... Uh, balm that fixes everything. So normally what happens is there's an algorithm that's in some sense discriminatory, and someone says that's a discriminatory algorithm, and they say, oh, okay, fine, we'll make it neutral. Everything's fine now. But what Google says is that the reason... So if you use Google and you type in the words, why do Jews, it will finish your sentence with the words, have big noses, or love money so much. Or if you search for an, uh, a name which sounds African-American, the first results that come up will often be results for crime background checks. This isn't because Google is inherently anti-Semitic or racist against African-American people. It's because it has a neutral algorithm which reflects the demands of previous users in the past. So what Google would say is the reason it autocorrects is because that's what so many people have asked. And the reason that link comes up is because what so many people have clicked on after they've searched for African-American sounding names. But as Desmond Tutu used to say, if, a, if an elephant is standing on the foot of a mouse and you say that you're neutral, the mouse isn't going to thank you for your neutrality. And Elie Wiesel, who, who was a hot, famous Holocaust survivor, used to say that neutrality favors the oppressor. It doesn't always. Neutrality can be useful, such as when you know, a judge is deciding between two accounts. But Google, in that example, is using a neutral algorithm that, that literally just replicates and amplifies an injustice that already exists in the world. And to my mind, that's not good enough. If you're actually engineering a product, as Google are, why can't you engineer in a way that doesn't result in racist results, and in fact, gets rid of some of the racism, so that the, the world is left better after every time the Google algorithm is used than it was to begin with? So whenever a, a software engineer turns around to you and says, we found a neutral way of doing this, raise an eyebrow at them, because neutrality is often just a, a cover for replicating or even amplifying injustices that already exist in the world. And what we should instead be trying to do is engineer our systems that produce outcomes that are just or that are fair or that improve our democracy, rather than which are simply neutral replicants of the very flawed and damaged world that we already live in. I used your question to rant about something that I care about. That's I, I apologize. Fine. Thank you. <laughs> have we got any more questions? I promise not to rant this time. We've got, so we've got a queue over here I haven't seen. Um, so I just had a question. Uh, I think you've explained really well, and thank you, um, the, I guess, like actions governments could take to regulate. Um, and I was just wondering from the perspective of um, tech companies and individuals, it seems like there could be a bit of a chicken and the egg problem where it doesn't seem profitable for tech companies to you know, be transparent, reveal their algorithms, and um, you know, self-regulate and have like, chief ethics officers, I think the New York Times asked, unless consumers you know, demand it um, and you know, kind of vote with their pocketbooks. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of consumer demand for that, at least you know, in the past 10 years or so. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering um, you know, what you think, I guess, um, companies could um, or actually are doing to potentially be more ethical and what uh, you know, consumers can do, I guess, at least on an individual basis. The, the way you describe the problem is uh, typical of the way a lot of journalists and tech folk will describe the problem. And it's the way that we've thought about it for decades, which is essentially a, a problem of capitalism, which is that if Facebook is egregious enough enough of us will leave Facebook to join something else. And, and you know, l like when we ditch uh, a favorite restaurant to go to a new one because we've decided that the quality of hygiene is better than the other one. There are enormous problems with that as a regulatory model, though, particularly in a world of um, economies of scale and network effects, which tend to apply to tech products. So if you and I tomorrow come up with a more ethical version of Facebook, and that's better in every single way than Facebook, it will still not be as valuable or useful as Facebook, not even nearly, because Facebook has a billion users, and they're what, they're what makes it valuable. And so if you use your feet and toddle off to some new social media um, platform, you're scarcely going to have much of an impact. 
So if you just think about it as in market terms, as consumers will move around, I think that's flawed. And I think that that's, that's actually what a lot of tech companies want us to think like is the truth because it, it doesn't lead to swift change. And even if it did lead to say the demolition of Facebook, the network effect would mean that what would likely replace Facebook is another monopoly over social media, which is why I see these problems as fundamentally political. And I know I sound awfully critical of tech firms, I'm not, and I speak to them a lot of the time, and they're filled with well-meaning people, but they're filled with human beings like any other institution, human beings which are now wielding, who are now wielding great power. And um, I don't think appointing an ethics officer is going to change the fact that they operate within a capitalist system, that they are required to divert, they are required to generate wealth for their shareholders, and to do so is not in any sense wrong. So absent political intervention, you can't criticize tech firms for pursuing profits, they're companies. That's what companies do. Um, so to my mind, the sooner we treat these companies as political entities as well as just economic entities, the better, because that will change the way we think about uh, when we want to uh, regulate or change the way that they work. I mean, the other thing I would say is it is just completely ludicrous that the way that most of our relationships with tech firms are governed is through, end, is through license agreements, which if you read all of them in, in a year would take 40 days of the year to get through and you still wouldn't understand them. I mean, I think if an alien was coming down from, from planet Zog and said, how do you regulate the relationship between your most powerful entities and the individual citizen? And you said, by means of a 40 page legal document, which I read, which I didn't read 10 years ago. And even if I had read, I wouldn't understand. They would say that that is not a good system of <laughs> governance. I mean, it's crazy. So I, I don't think that the, the law of contract or the law of private commercial relationships is, in, is is going to be a sustainable way of governing these relationships in the future. I think it'll be everyone's, in everyone's interest if we start treating these problems as political as well as commercial. I'm sure that doesn't at all answer your question, but uh, that's the best I've got. I guess the, the follow-up is like, is there anything you know, an individual can or should do to, uh, I guess, besides vote for politicians? You've got to spread the word. I mean, like, the, the, the truth is that uh, individuals have always asked, what can I do? They say, what can I do against the company? I'm just one worker. If I strike, uh, there'll just be someone to take my place. Or what can I do against this king? I'm just one serf, I'm just one peasant. The answer to your question is the answer of politics, which is that what we need is collective action. We need enough people thinking in a similar enough way to change the behaviors of society as a whole. And it's an incredibly daunting and unthinkably deep and wide task. But think a little bit about climate change. I think this is how people felt a couple of decades ago with that issue. And we're not there yet, but we're certainly in a better place than we were. And, you know, when I did my slide on this, I said the first issue is education. Most people are still thinking about technology as consumers and not as citizens in the same way that you still think about an aircraft as a form of transport before you've learned that it could actually be something that contributes to environmental damage as well. Thank you. I think this is, uh, I think this is related to what you were just saying, which I think is really interesting of uh, the point of that they are political issues and political entities rather than just economic or commercial yeah. things that we use for fun or turn on the lights in our house. Um, so it seems like uh, technology is, the problems that we're facing with technology are really similar to the problems that we face maybe with the printing press, with newspapers, and with books. Because, uh, you know, in some of what we're discussing, it seems like we're going to a state of less freedoms, but how much freedom, how many of our parents or how many of us really read more than one newspaper growing up or read more than two newspapers? Or think about the proliferation of fake news. An example, the, the protocols of the elders of Zion, yeah. you know, how that was able to be printed 500,000 times or whatever by people who had money or people who had access to the printing presses. So how different is our freedoms from then to our freedoms from now, is it a greater magnitude? Or what can we also learn from the way we viewed or regulated freedom of the press? Or what Barnes & Noble decides to put as books in their store is what we're going to purchase. Yeah. And then what's in the newspaper, where the crimes go. Are they, you know, famously how some events in the Holocaust were on page seven rather than on page one. So what we see, are these the same problems? Is it just a greater magnitude? Is it a perception of how we viewed newspapers as 
reading material versus political entities or, I don't know. It's a very, yeah. uh, if I may say so, sensible question to ask. And to a certain extent, you're right. A lot of the things I'm describing, particularly in relation to what I call perception control, are similar to problems that we faced in the past. But if I may uh, I make a few points. First is that they were problems in the past. The fact that the protocols of the elders of Zion achieved widespread currency in Europe over a certain period was a problem, which was not dealt with. Likewise, the problem of the 20th century that a lot of people w would... Um, inevitably subscribe to uh, news outlets that only provided one point of view from one particular part of the world, and that in some senses led to the closure of a great many minds. The difference with technology is, is first of all, the newspaper didn't watch you back, and technologies do. The ones that we rely on to get our news are also gathering information about which news we read, but also what we do on the internet and everything else in our lives because they're purchasing data about us from other sources as well. And so it's that combination not just of giving us information and filtering the world, but also getting information about us, which makes the influence and potentially manipulation so much more intense. Secondly, newspapers didn't make rules in the way that your tech firm or your self-driving car or your virtual reality system or whatever technology you're using are, is did. So that's just a, new, a completely new form of power that mm -hmm. tech firms have. Thirdly, the fact that these things are automated and increasingly done by digital systems means A, they are immensely more powerful than human beings ever were at it, and B, they're immensely more inscrutable. I think you always knew where you stood with The Guardian or The Telegraph. I don't know what the equivalents are in this country, The Washington Post and The New York Times. You knew where you stood. You don't always know where you stand. In fact, you rarely know where you stand with an algorithm. Um, most people probably don't know what an algorithm is. They've never been taught it. It's not something we were brought up to learn. So to a certain extent, yes, these are new problem, old problems in a new form, but I do think they're hypercharged, and I think that they are different in the ways that I just described. Hope that helps. Final question? Uh, yeah, let's do it. Awesome. A lot of pressure. Big one. Let's make it, let's bring it home. Uh, <laughs> I'm curious how you balance um, sort of societal constructivism and technological determin t determinism. Yeah. Um, I tend to think that like ubiquity and speed are some of the main factors of our technologies today, and they then express themselves in our so uh, social world. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how you think about balancing those. Well, to, to make sure I fully understand your question, because there were some big words there, um, I think what you're saying is, is the future of technology predetermined and does it does it as it were determine social forms are we are we, are we going to be shaped by it or, or to what extent is it open to us to shape the technologies ourselves right so we shape our tools and our tools exactly. shape us but there are i don't know i think there are some tenets of technology that mm -hmm. express themselves very clearly mm -hmm. and then we adopt them in in a social sense so we expect speed and ubiquity yeah. from our technology, and then we expect them in the social sphere. Yeah, Evgeny Morozov writes well about this stuff. He says that, you know, the more we, we begin to think like we think about technology, we think right. about social issues, and actually that's not such a bad thing, as in, in the book I argue that actually a lot of political questions are algorithmic in nature, if you really think about them. Uh, I would say, first of all, it's too early to tell. I don't think that our, the way that we think of, has been so comprehensively shaped by technology that it can't yet be reshaped. B, that um, I, I jolly well hope and do argue in the book that the intellectual capacity to frame the future and frame the way we think about the future is still within our grasp. If I sound a little bit determinist at times, like we're being controlled or we're being influenced by our technologies, it's because I don't think we've got in the ring yet. I don't think that we've really started the philosophical endeavor of trying to understand the world that we're creating. And in that sense, I don't think it's a fair fight. I think our thoughts are being so comprehensively shaped and framed by the radically changing world around us that we haven't yet picked ourselves up and shaken ourselves off and stepped back and said, how should this be, and could it be different? It's a quizzical face you've got. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, is there time for me to? Yeah, uh, okay, 
Um, I would say we've been being shaped by our technologies since the printing press, you know? Mm -hmm. Basically, structured thought comes from reading structured arguments, and we've been shaped all the way up until now um, in different ways, TV, radio, different sort of um, expressions that we then send out into the social sphere. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that, but, I, but, what, but what I would say is that it differs from cultural context to context. So the introduction of the printing press in China led to a very different set of results from the introduction of the printing press in Europe. Sure. Likewise with the internet. When the internet was born 20 years ago, everyone said the decentralized nature of this platform means that it will really empower the little guy at the edges of the network to participate in a way that is as um, meaningful as the massively powerful information source at the center. But because of the world in which the internet was born, that is to say, a world of democratic capitalism populated by large powerful companies and large powerful governments, increasingly the internet has become the plaything of those governments and those companies. And the, our experience of the internet is, in, is entirely dominated by them and, and done on their terms. So, you know, Marx had a lot to say about this, but there is obviously a great cycle and, and lots of confusing interactions between our ideas and our philosophy, the economic and social and religious and cultural context and technology, which is part of these two, but also something separate from it. Um, not enough good thinking has been done about this very question, though. There are a couple of great books on it, but most of them were written 15 years ago. You should write the next one. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. All right.